Two things that you're not allowed to carry in taxi cab. One is fish, the other is bedding that goes under health laws. Tell you what it takes to be a good cab driver. All you need is a weak mind and a strong back. <laughs> You'll meet a woman who she'll cry on your shoulder and tell you her whole goddamn trouble inside and out. Then after she'll get through, she'll say, what the hell am I telling you? I hate to go to get stuck up again. I'm afraid of what would happen again. You know, like, you can't press your luck. If I get one to pass the Bronx, I don't know the Bronx. I've been riding around here for 35 years. That, that Bronx is like China. Brooklyn, I can get along. There are 13,000 taxi cabs in New York City, and some of them private. In a night and day shift, that adds up to 26,000 cabbies, with 12,000 more to take care of the other hours that give around-the-clock service to the citizens and visitors of New York. And every one of those 38,000 drivers has at the time years ago when he started hacking as a temporary job. The only other trade I knew I got out of because my feet bothered me. I was a waiter. So in order to get off my feet, I took a job sitting down. <laughs> it's just something that I had to do or do nothing. And when I got into it, so as the years went by, that was it. I lost. I had, uh, I couldn't get no other job. And not, uh, not that this was any better. I used to sell for a house, and the house folded up. And then I got married, and then I started to raise a family. So I couldn't get uh, locate no other job. And as the years went by, I was getting older, and that was it. I often wonder why the fellas, the new fellas, come in to drive a cab today, when, or even a few years back, when their opportunities were far more greater than what the opportunity that, that, that I had, because I couldn't get a job no how. When I got out of the army, I went and I worked for an undertaker, riding dead people. Yeah. But there wasn't enough of them dying. You know, that's the time when they give you 50 cents for a call. Today, that same that same job, the undertakers, a driver gets seven and a half dollars when he goes out that car to go to the cemetery. If he goes twice to the cemetery, it's 15 dollars. That's how change and things change. Uh -huh. I was in that three years, seven years, and then I went on a hack. But this ain't a bad racket if you can move, but you can't move. You see, we operate on a commission. I think it's the craziest business to be in. Anything cut throat is no good. Everything I earn is commission. The more you earn, the more commission you make. It becomes a competitive business. You're out there cutthroat. So you get to the point where you don't care. Well, just to my sorrow, the opportunity to become a cop in New York City, I would have been a retired cop today. I could have been doing this now, making a little side money with a pension. If I wouldn't be doing this, I'd be a special cop in a bank or some damn thing. There's there are 23,800 cops out of a population of 8.5 million people in New York. And while it's the business of every cabbie to search for fares among the vast multitude of pedestrians, it's the cop who occupies his thoughts. The cop gives you an argument. He's right. No matter if he's wrong, he's still right. Keep your mouth shut. The cop is waving. You know, the come on. So I go. So he stops me, you know, and he says to me, Not, I didn't tell you to go. He says, I was telling the other... I said, what do you mean you didn't tell me to go? You know, and then I start to think to myself, I said, I better not aggravate the guy, you know. Yeah. What is it, the guy on the left of me, the guy, I mean, the guy on the right of me, the guy on the left of me can go and I can't. But I didn't, you know what I mean, if you, if you say anything well, to him, he's... For the most right part, they're, they're, they're understanding. See, we had to break the law a lot in order to get around the city. You can't... You can't drive uh, uh, strictly to the letter of the law because you'd never get anywhere. An intelligent, considerate cop will understand that, see? And he'll overlook, see, when I pull over this way here to get in with this guy instead of standing directly behind him as a law book would tell you, see? See, he makes a left, right? Yeah. Well, I should really get sure I keep to the, to the extreme left and I shoot with him across and I make it. The cab sitting in front of the... Hotel George Washington there. This fella here who just got out of my car is calling the guy, calling the guy, the guy don't move. I'm cruising up, I see him, I pull right in. I get the call. The hockey, after I get the call, the hockey gets sore, he pulls up to me, he says, what do you think I'm sitting here for? 
But what Scott says, the guy is calling you, but he just told me himself the man. He called you twice, you don't move. Well, how did that make money? That same guy you talked to him tonight when he's through working? It was a rough day today. I couldn't get it. I couldn't get it. I lose calls too. Now I ain't talking knocking the guy because he lost the call. I lose lots of calls too reading the paper. From 42nd and Park to 46th and 12th. From 46th and 12th to Bowling Green. From Wall and South Street to 70th Street in New York. From 85th Street in Lexington Avenue to 23rd Street. That's the call. And now this last job. One after another. You gotta know certain places to be at a certain time and certain villains to hit at a certain time. And you gotta get on to get around a little bit, and you can't stand on the corner and keep reading the paper. I'm a great guy for baseball, see? I like baseball. In the summertime, there can be a thousand calls. If I'm looking at something for baseball, I keep reading. I don't want to know about the call. You know what I mean? Someone hailed me here. Don't you think I jump around? I mean, they don't do it no more than what they used to, but on Broadway, they still do it a little bit. I mean, I mean, after all, uh, if a businessman had to do a little bit of, you know, uh, you know, conniving to pull off a deal, wouldn't he do it? You know, the same thing. See? And if a cab had to block traffic in order to get someone, he'd do it just as well as if you was driving your car and you, you saw you looking for your wife, see? And you suddenly spotted her, she ran out, you'd stop the car and take her in, wouldn't you? Driving cars block traffic. Gagner Street, let traffic go for 48 hours. What would you do? I'm not kidding. What would you do? The more parking lots in Midtown, the heavier traffic there is. Do away with your parking lots in Midtown from 14th Street to 59th Street. No parking allowed in the daytime, only after 6 o'clock. There's your, you solve your whole traffic problem. If you or me can't know that we have nowhere to park it, we're not going to bring it in there. But if Mr. Ashma so knows he's got a parking lot, he can afford it at buck two, he's going to bring his car in. That car doesn't stop him from coming in. Without the car, he'll have to come in just the same. And as long as you got them parking lots right around on Broadway and Midtown, you're going to have a traffic problem. That's your only salvation. Go away with your parking lots in daytime, and you got no traffic problem. There is no other way out. If you know that you are not allowed to park here, you're not going to bring that car in. But if you know you can park it, you're going to bring it in. You work here, you're going to come in just the same. And if you want to shop near Macy's, you're going to come just the same. There it is. 85 cents. Listen, if I had to worry about traffic like the average driver, he gets on the road, traffic, it bothers him, he gets ulcers. If I had to do that, you know, I'd be in a straitjacket four times every month. After all, I'm in traffic all day long. So I don't even give it a thought. Listen, to me, I take it as the Congress. But that's a fact, though. Anybody who drives for a living day in and day out, if he had to worry about traffic and had to have him so why they put him in a straitjacket. I already had my ulcers. So now I take everything the way it is. Nothing bothers me whatsoever. Traffic is bad, it's bad. Yeah, I was in some mess at one time. Not only one time, I still suffer occasionally, even right now. Remember one thing, when you're used to the outside, you work on the outside. That's your life. That's why I'm a healthy man today at 57. If anybody gets to my age as healthy as me, they're good. I got my own teeth in my mouth. 20, 20 eyes, good heart. I can handle myself as good as I was. The cab driver in New York has an average of 40 calls a day, all of them strangers, people who, for the length of a trip, share a momentary seclusion with the driver and who can become friends or are enemies. The first thing I did, I took my teeth out, and my false teeth, my wristwatch. <laughs> I lay him right down on the seat, and I've handled him. 10 inches taller than me and 60 pounds heavier than me, and I'm only 170 pounds. But I'm five foot two. And when I used to box, I used to box at 140. Oh. So I don't worry me, uh, some of the big guys. Because they, they're all left-handed to me. <laughs> but I mean, I don't look for a fight, but if the guy starts swinging, my, my, my salvation is I got to swing too. <laughs> That's protection. I go home at night and it's battle fatigue every night. You wind up like this. Before I start, mm, 
little. You know, I didn't get punchy in the ring. I'm going to get punchy in there. It's an interesting life. Oh, yeah. You never know who you're going to pick up. You never know who you're going to meet up with either. You're leaving the morning. You love you coming back. Me up on 100th Street in Central Park, West Manhattan. Very dark street. I always thought what would happen if I got stuck up. Give them everything they want, right? Let them get out. After I give my money, he says, now take me to a dark street. Then I started to get diarrhea because we're on a dark street. All they had to do was run out if he wanted to. I wouldn't chase him. He only had a 25 Italian automatic, but uh, it makes a big hole regardless. So I says, well, how about this, fellas? Is it dark enough for you? I says, give me a break. I says, I got a family and all that. And with that, as I was talking, I opened the door. He didn't hit it, the latch open, see? As he said, no, it wasn't dark enough, I actually fell out of the cab. The cab was stopped. I fell out of the cab, I ran to the back of the cab, and then I ran to the front. And the Marine Corps teach you to zig and zag. I never zigged and zagged any better. He must have been shot that I jumped out on him because he didn't fire. But I yelled, stick up, stick up. Two cops started running across with their guns, and they started firing at one another. And he gave himself up. I hate the thought of getting stuck up again. I'm afraid of what would happen again. You know, like, you can't press your luck. I did what was uh, supposed to be done. I gave my money and everything else, I said, so. But he wanted to go further. I knew he didn't want to kiss me goodnight. I didn't know I'd like the idea of him hitting me on the head or putting a bull to me. You can't, can't tell about these guys. The cook de gras, the whole thing, the guy, he was a Columbia student. Well, did you have your picture in the news? Yeah, yeah. And the guy, you felt he was better looking? Yeah. Better dressed I than you? To the, I said to the photographer, look, I'm the cab driver. He's a stick-up guy. He was dressed in a suit and a white shirt and tie, and I had an old sweater on. Cab drivers are given commendations for their cooperation with the police and health departments, for helping catch criminals, delivering babies, responding to any emergencies. But there are the unnoted events, too, the life in the back of a moving cab that is private, privileged, and unannounced in the press. A girl started to get undressed in the cab, say. Picked up on 121st Street and 3rd Avenue. She's going to 42nd Street and 3rd Avenue. So she gets in the cab with this box, you know. That time I was there, was about four years ago, I was driving one of those big cabs. And I'm going down 3rd Avenue, you know. And I looked in the mirror to see if anybody was behind me. Here's this girl in Brazil. So, you know, so I looked, I, I, I looked back and I snapped down my brake. I said, hey, what are you doing? She said, gee, I'm late for my job. I have to get dressed, you know. I said, girl, you can't get dressed in this cab. I said, you going to put these things on again. She said, well, I'm almost dressed already, you know. <clears throat> so then she says, will you come back here and zip up my, my, my skirt up? I said, not me, girl. Nothing doing. Uh, you want to call that interesting, but I was really, you know, I was afraid to, the cop would stop me and wonder what the hell's going on there. You know how these girls are, you know, get back there and then she, maybe she stop hollering blue murder and maybe she hasn't got the money for the fare and then she'll start saying I gotta do something, you know? Yeah. I said, not me, girl. I ain't getting out of the front seat. Sunday, I'd get a kid from Idlewild Airport to White Plains, a college girl. So she's telling me everything that's happening in Dallas, Texas. You know, different things like that. And every once in a while, when you meet a wise one, you'll be 75 cents on the clock, and she'll say, yeah, do you want a dollar or do you want to come upstairs? You know, things like that. No doubt a lady, you know what I mean? She lived in a nice neighborhood, and she invited me upstairs. And then, believe it or not, her boyfriend came in. Is that a predicament? Is that embarrassing? <laughs> <laughs> so you went. <laughs> what? You went. But he paid me to go. That's the funniest part of it. <laughs> he says, here, take this and get out of here. <laughs> All right, you got it? Yeah. A hacky in New York is supposed to be the man who knows his way around. If you want to go somewhere, he's been there. If you want to know something, he knows it. If you've got a story, he's heard it. Well, let the cabbie tell it himself. Well, uh, I didn't have no fare in the same. Now, if I get a job way up, I, if I get one past the Bronx, I don't know the Bronx. I've been riding around here for 35 years. That, that Bronx is like China. Brooklyn, I can get along with Brooklyn, fine. But that Bronx, you know, way over there, you know, there's just name streets, no numbers, you know. 
I'm right. I'm right. I'm right. Nothing looks familiar at all. I saw it under the goddamn river. So I asked the guy, what the hell were you down? Yeah, bank. <laughs> he know how to get there, he said. We were up around his neighborhood there, but it must have taken him a half an hour to find him. Turn here, I think. Turn, uh... Oh, you better go straight a while. <laughs> I mean, they don't know how the hell they get there. How the hell am I going to know? Happened a couple of years ago. It was on Madison Avenue at 59th Street. I stopped for a red light. And I'm waiting for the light to change. And there's a whole lot of people, you know, standing waiting for the bus. All of a sudden, some fellow staggers over to my cab. He, he says, what do I owe you? I look at him. <laughs> the guy was crazy. So I want to go along with a joke. I says, well, Buck will be all right. So he takes out the dollar. He says, you ain't getting no tip, brother. You didn't take me where I want to go. And he staggers away. Everybody started laughing. <laughs> Taxi cabs are licensed to convey passengers to their homes, places of business, and entertainment. But there's another license in a cab. And that is the license to speak, to talk as no other brief encounter allows. The driver and his fare exchange narratives that friends find hard to share. And they do it because they will probably never meet again. And from it, the cabbie learns, and in turn, instructs his other fares. Most people are not satisfied. No matter what the financial condition they're in or, or what have you, they're always, uh, they always want a little better. A lot of people have to go to psychiatrists and are not even aware of it. Now, if a smart person knows when he needs help and goes after it. But unfortunately, a lot of people uh, are not aware that they have difficulties or they have... Because everybody has slight complexes and neuroses and things like that. But most people are not even aware of it. And in most cases, it's a normal thing for a person to have. It's when it's uh, going to cause you trouble that uh, is the important thing. Who knows when it is or when it isn't, or if it ever will. I tell you, a lot of people are still... Uh, living in an age of ignorance, as far as a lot of things go. If they treat the mind as they treat other parts of their body, if you had a broken arm, you go to a hospital, you go to a doctor, you get it set, fixed, and that's it. But uh, with other things, they don't consider it the same way. In themselves or in other people, they have a, a funny attitude about the mind. Even the medical profession doesn't know as much as they would like to know about the mind. And they're studying, they're learning. Now I know from life that uh, many you want huh? Uh, 95th. For life, there are three reasons why anybody does any kind of work for a livelihood. Yeah. Do you ever know that? No. Now, there are three groups of people in this world. There's one group of people, they lose their job, they can't take another job, they can't tackle us unless they get the same thing they were doing. They're yeah. lost. Then you get another group of people, and I know a lot of people like this also, they, what you call, they, uh, they uh, disregard their health for the sake of money. They love money. A lot of people will get ulcers, get high blood pressure, you know, they have stand fit as long as they're making money. They disregard their health, say that. Now, that's because they want to make money. Now, then you get the trade group that I'm in. They do something for a living. As long as they like it, they disregard the, 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 the income. Now, I'm driving all these years, but I love driving. I love the public. I love to be open here, and I love to be independent. I don't want to be pushed around. I love that. I'd rather do this than make twice as much on something else that I didn't like to do. But I love being free. Who are these men? How do they live away from the job? They've been called wise guys and con men, poets and bums, raconteurs of the streets using the idiom of the avenues. But what happens to them at home? How do they live? I have to work 10, 11 hours a day. You have to do it be between your operating expenses and your home obligations. I have two growing boys, a boy going on 14, and a boy going on 10. They need clothes. Naturally, I, I try to give them the things that I didn't have in my childhood. That all costs money. And of course, I have to work real hard in order to accomplish those things. 
But you don't mind doing it. Again. I don't mind doing it because I'm doing I'm I'm doing it for them. I mean, it's a thing. It's an awful thing to make yeah. a living. A lot of people look down upon you, but those people are wrong when they look down upon you because you're a cab driver. That is my opinion, and it's very true. It seems to me it's really it's actual right. human experience. Is what I say now. As far as my experiences with people, I could write a book. As one man told me one time, he says he never heard a man to have the philosophy of life as I had, the way I look upon things. Well, I told him, worrying don't get you nowhere. Oh, I said, where the hell were you? Where you been? Oh, I got home. I'm all right. Where, where do you think I've where I've been? If I'm not home at a certain time tonight, now if I go home tonight, I usually get home about say. Five between five five thirty. Tonight I'm pulling in early. But if I get if I come home early, she won't. How come you're home early? But if I come home late, right away she's got a puss on. <laughs> Cook your own meal. What the hell are you matter with you? What's biting you? She's right away. She's actually inspecting my handkerchief. Jealousy is a bad thing, you know. This used to be. See, this is my second wife. When I got married during the war, it was. I went three times away from the justice of the peace. I, was, I didn't want to marry the girl. I didn't want to hurt her, you know, because she came down from New York. And she started bawling. I walked away from her three times, so I said, oh, the hell, I got married. Now I, I go home, I give her a good day's pay. She's happy. If she's happy, I'm happy. Avoid all trouble. She's got the kids with her. As soon as I come in the house, I'm going to make day, Daddy. <laughs> Out in the street, they'll call out, Daddy, how much do you make today? <laughs> Shut up, will you? What the hell? You want everybody to know my business? I got a couple of kids home, and I used to be awful in my younger days, and my wife knows it. So when I get home, she's got a, a light chain on the sink, and all she has to do is just snap it right on, and I'm in for the night. I don't know anything, because yeah. I've been always... I don't know, a lot of husbands like to hand that checks in. I don't do things like that. I find out, I give her $35 a week for the table money. If there's any clothes or anything, naturally I'll pay for that also. But uh, she gets 35 bucks a week for the table. After that, I don't want to, in other words, I'm the boss in the house, that's it. This was your first wife. Yeah, my first wife. So she was a good kid, good-hearted girl and everything else, I mean, but she just liked to be a fly-by-night, you know? She wasn't ready for marriage. So I told her, I said, all right, I'm going my way. I said, you go your way, get a divorce, whatever you want to do, I'll be the other one to put it out down for adultery because that's the only way in New York you can get it. So at the time, I met my wife. We weren't living together then. And uh, after we got the divorce, the, uh, she used to pass up and down in front of the house all the time after my wife and I got married. And my wife used to say, well, tell her she's passed by. Boy, she kind of starts to trouble with something. Why, you going out with her yet? Will you forget about the past? So I don't want to know the girl. So I used to it. But don't you think she still brings it up after 10 years? Oh, uh, she always sees bad things. Now, she'll pick up a dish or a pot of... I've had to pick up a, a frying pan with food or eggs in it. And throw it at me. Throw his shoes at me. Take off his shoes and throw it at me, boy. And I just don't talk to him. my oldest brother that married off there. I invite him to my two children's uh, uh, wedding. But he has two children. I, invo I invited them. I didn't leave nobody out. And he didn't invite you to... He invited me and my daughter, but left my son out. We can do without you. We're just brothers in name, not in blood. Goodbye. And I don't miss him. See, I have a sister on, uh, his wife would come down and tell you, how can you leave Jay out? She'd come down for four months and tell you, how can you do a thing like that? People have talked about it. You didn't send a birthday card, she came down for two weeks after and then talked about it for two years. What do you think of Sarah forgot her even birthday? What do you know about that? My son's birthday you forgot. Well, how do you like that? I said, you haven't forgot to invite my son to the wedding. He's a nephew of yours. How do you like it? So long, you're too bad after 32 years of my married life, I found you out. I wouldn't care if you invited no children, but there's a big family of brothers and sisters in my home, and they all have children, and he invited every one. If you don't like Jay, let me know. What do you got against him? You a little smarter than your sons? Huh? Make a little more money? What are you, showing? Are you jealous?
every friend of his town was at the wedding, see? So I wouldn't care if he had the friends if he didn't have any other children of the family. I would, we would be contented, but not leave out one, one nephew and his wife. It was my son and his wife. So I sent my invitation back too. I didn't go. Mm -hmm. Some people change in life as they go along. Yeah. A marriage is a wonderful institution if you hit it right. And the chances are, I'll say, 95%. 95 to 5. In favor of it, huh? In favor. Uh, it's the kind of a fellow you are yourself. It's the kind of a fellow you are yourself. You want a home? You play 50-50? As a rule, I say, it is 95%. Good. What's the best way to handle a uh, woman? Well, some yes and some no. It's hard to say. Some, shall I say, if you give them too much authority, they take too much liberty. If you show them a, 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 give them an even break, they'll try to give you an even break. This is some time ago, about yeah. a month ago. Now, being green in this particular modernistic uh, art, I thought it was a jumble of colors. I wanted something like Gainsborough, Whistler, something that I could see the lines, the realistic lines and so on. And so, anyway, I brought my son because his English teacher, whether he was interested in art or whether it was in conjunction with the literature he was studying, I don't know, recommended these boys to go to, to the modern art. So the kid went there and he seen a confusion of colors. He didn't know what the hell it was all about and so on. So when he went back, he gave his opinion, which was contrary to the teacher's opinion, and that, of course, irritated the teacher to the point that she gave him 10% 10 10 less in his studies. Now, I got a very intelligent woman connected with this thing, fortunately, because I discussed the matter with her. She said that she just visits there, but I feel that she may be an artist or something like that, because she, she was very sympathetic in this particular field. She said, we do not expect anyone that's a newcomer to this field to understand it immediately. No more than a child has to learn to walk. This is a thing that you must learn through first explanation. The woman was so kind that she gave me this book and didn't give me a tip. That was damn nice. I said, but are you sure you don't? She said, don't forget about it. That's your tip. Wasn't that nice? Yes, that was nice of her. And the cab driver isn't a bad guy either. He's tired like the rest of us. Sore because business wasn't too good, with traffic in his ears. But hit him right when you both feel better, and you've got a lot to learn. I've been working for about three hours, you see. Yeah. And here I only have this one job, you see, and I'm sitting there disgusted like. And this fella comes over to me. He looked like a Chinese fella. He walked in and uh, he says to me, uh, LaGuardia Airport, without any baggage or anything. So uh, I started to strike up a conversation. I didn't know what to say. And I happened to hear over the radio that it was a Chinese New Year. Tonight, yeah. Yeah. So I said, I, I suppose I should wish you a, a happy New Year today. He says, no, he says, most people are under that impression. He says, but I'm not Chinese, I'm Japanese, see? So uh, we started talking, and on the way out to the airport, it's a pretty long trip. He's telling me that he's only over here for a year, and uh, he's in the export business, and we're, we're talking, and he's a uh, college graduate, and... Uh, talking about different things. He seemed to be a very wonderful fella. Told me he's coming over here to pick up a friend of his at the airport. And uh, when he told me that, so when we got out there, I told him, look, I says, if you don't mind, I would wait for you until your friend comes off the plane and take us back to New York. And he thought that was very nice. So we stopped off, went inside and checked and found out we had a half an hour to go till the plane came in. So he invites me for, in to lunch. And we have a sandwich and coffee and a I tried to leave the conversation over to him so that he could ask me questions, you know, and I could yeah. find out what we can say to each other. So uh, it was a little hard understanding him because he, he had told me that he had uh, learned English over in Japan, but still and all he had a bad accent, and it was very hard to understand. He asked me about my family, how I met my wife, and uh, little different things like that, you know. And, uh, he, and I told me that he wasn't going back to see his family, which consisted of his wife and his son, for another three years. So here I said to myself, here's a guy who was here for three years, 
He lives in the Windermere Hotel on 92nd Street, and he, he must be a pretty lonely guy, you know? So he turns around and, and asks me for my address and my telephone number. So in turn, I took his phone number and the address where he lives, you see. And uh, I'm even thinking of inviting him over to the house for supper some night, if he'll accept it, you know. But uh, the, the, the reason that I wanted to tell you about this is because I think that it's, it's such an unusual thing for, uh, you know, if it happened with an American or somebody who came from a different part of the country, but here's a guy who is Japanese, you know, and uh, in some ways he's so much like uh, we are, and in other ways they're supposed to be so mysterious and everything, you know. And I just thought it was uh, it was really a wonderful experience. I mean, I felt very good about yeah. it, you know. This was the only time that I felt that way with a European. I shouldn't say that, because I speak French fluently, fortunately. And I've taken people who couldn't speak any English whatsoever to their various destinations for which I got a big thrill in New York, you know? You know what I mean? When you know that you're doing something with a full heart. So those little times that I do get these feelings from this business, it compensates for all the, uh, the heartaches and the other uh, bad things that might happen to you during the course of the day. I don't play with people. I just... Don't give a damn. I don't know how you feel towards your work. I just hate my work. I hate it. What am I going to do? I got to do it to make a living. And when I make, I'm satisfied. I'm not going to jump out of the building. I make enough for my needs. That's all. What I would like that's out of my reach. A little business of my own where I could work for myself instead of working for someone else. But it is definitely out of my reach, and I don't give it a second thought. You want to be a taxi driver forever? Is that the way you want to die? <laughs> it has to be. I guess that's the way it'll have to be. <laughs>